Okay, so we'll restart then. So before we start, there were I remember, yeah, I remember during the break that there were a few things I wanted to say that I forgot. So um, uh, one thing, I I offer office hours quite frequently, not just for the class but for everything. So I try as much as possible to have a open door office policy, even though I'm not in the office. And so I I, I offer office hours like four times a week at least for thirty minutes. If you go on my on my personal website, there's a little calendar applet on the on the left. You'll see office hours there, and then there's a link there that takes you to the forum with the Zoom link. The Zoom link is just not there, so that there's you know only people from Moetaha get access. But yeah, feel free to stop by. I mean, ask questions. Have you just want to chat about any of these topics? I'm I'm happy to chat whenever and just completely open. And if you have trouble, just let me know, and I can send you the link directly. And, uh, you know, Nikita and Pedro and the other TAs will probably sporadically offer office hours once in a while. But in any case, you have mine that you can go to. I'm, I'm there almost almost every morning. I, I have office hours of some type. And, yeah, they tend to not be very busy. So feel free to show up whenever you want. And, uh, okay, another thing So that I completely forgot. So there is a plan. So the, the course... In, and the lectures and both things. So the lectures, will, the course will be is rather mathematical and the lectures will be rather mathematical. And the exercise sessions will mostly focus on the homework problems, which themselves will be also rather mathematical with the idea that the homework problem should, should uh, resemble in some form, you know, problems in the exam, right? And, uh, but it's, it's very nice when you're learning these things to be able to play with a bit of code or a bit with, even if it's simulated data and so on. And so we'll post on the forum at some point, uh, maybe like little Jupyter notebooks of Python code to play around with some of the things, just so that you see sort of the power of some of the techniques that we're gonna derive, right? Even though we're gonna be doing very much mathematics, we'll try to put some code so that you can play around with, with some data and, data and see that really the, what the power is of, the, of these techniques. And so Christoph Glanzer, I'm not sure it's here, is going to be uh, preparing some Jupyter notebooks and they'll post them on the on the forum or on the course website. And there'll be a way for you to you know, play around with them, change as you want. And so there'll, there'll be probably one soon about the k-means, which is what I'm gonna talk about uh, today. And then things about, uh, you know, truncated SVD and so on, which is what I'm gonna be doing in uh, next week. And, I mean, not all topics, uh, yeah, lend themselves nicely for for uh, for um, um, you know for Jupyter notebooks of, of, uh, of or or coded scripts to try on data, but these do and when they do, we'll have we'll have some form of it. Okay. So the other thing uh, I wanted to 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 show, to ask you before we start, and actually I wanted to launch a, a little poll just to get a better sense of your background. This will help us. So I'll put a poll if you can just reply to it. You should like be very intrusive and just show up in front of your screen. Hard to miss. Okay. Ah, and of course, if you find any typos on the notes, please please let us know. It's easy to fix, and I'm sure they'll they'll have uh, several typos. They're quite uh, they're quite. I'm just going as I'm. Uh, yeah. We're just writing them as we're teaching, so I'm sure we'll have some. Ah. Okay. Okay, and I just saw a few other people reply me on the chat. All right, thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. So. Okay, so I'm going to talk about clustering and k-means. Th this will be very much a warm-up. Like this, this lecture will be a lot less mathematical than the others. Will be uh, will be a bit of a warm-up for the course. But you know, probably many of you have heard about k-means. is a, is a very nice and uh, neat algorithm and so on. So it's definitely worth uh, worth explaining. There's in order to start doing some real math around k-means, uh, uh, one needs to to develop tools that, that I'm that I don't have time for or, or that I cannot do in this prerequisite. And I would say that mathematics is not the most interesting thing around key means as well. And so it's just, it'll be nice to do a warm up, and I'll, I'll put some, some actual mathematical statements around it. OK, so we'll talk about, about clustering. Okay. Make sure that, that the recording is going. Okay, so we'll talk about clustering <clears throat> and in particular k-means. 
uh, known as k-means clustering. Right, then or next week we'll start with dimension reduction. Okay, so the idea is let's say that we get data points, right? So x1 through xn, they're again in Rd, and we want to cluster them. We want to separate them into clusters, right? And so let's say that they look like this, right? Again, I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, d equals 2 for the picture, but of course, not, not what, I, what I, the theory I want to develop should not require d equals 2 at all. <clears throat> Okay, let's say that I have these and maybe some other ones here and maybe some other ones over here. Right, this clearly you look at this data set and it very much looks like there's three clusters. And so let's imagine that you knew there were three clusters. So you knew what K is and we're gonna do, we're gonna separate it into, into clusters, right? So let's say that K equals three. Okay, and then I'll describe exactly what, what I mean by this. So how do we even, how can we even define an objective on, uh, on clustering, right? Clearly <clears throat> clusters should be sets of points that are close to each other, right? And, uh, and, and if points are in the same cluster, they should be close to each other. And if they're in different clusters, they should be, diff they should be far away from each other, right? And so one, one way to do this is to say, well, let's associate it to each cluster a center, right? Maybe let's say a center here, right? Clearly these are three clusters. I mean, this is a, a, a data set that looks very much like three clusters. And now the way I can measure, you know, how, how well I'm clustering my data is the price I pay is how far each of these points are from my clusters. This is exactly the idea of k-means, right? So I, I pay a price for each one of these distances, right? And so on, I'll, I'll spare you from drawing in all of them. But, uh, and so the idea is given x1 through xn points in Rn, let's say, let me make it be a bit more formal. So S, like a set S of points, x1 through xn, right? So S themselves is, is a subset of our N or our D, sorry. I, I promised I was going to use D for dimensions. Yeah. Okay. Now K means attempts to, to so K means okay, is the solution to the following optimization problem. So it attempts to find partitions, so to minimize right, over partitions, partition S1, SK of S, right? So we're partitioning all points into two S clusters. In this case, this partition would be these is one, this would be S1, this would be S2, and so on, right? But we we'll optimize over all partitions and over all centers, which I'm gonna write mu one the way to mu k will also be points in Rd. Okay, and the, the objective function we're gonna be minimizing is the sum, right, over all clusters. So let me you know, just have the, the index variable L, okay? And then for each cluster, we minimize over all elements in the cluster, the distance square between the element and the center. Okay, this is one particular. So this is the objective for k-means. So k-means attempts to solve the following problem. Okay, so in particular in this solution, the price of k-means would be the sum of the squares of the lengths of the red lines. Right, maybe it's worth, uh, right, so the, the k-means cost, if it's worth saying that, k-means cost, right, in this case, would be sum of squares of lengths of red lines. Right, and now you can ask, well, how, what is the best partition and centers as to minimize the, 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 the total, the sum of the squares of these red links. And this is exactly what, what K-means attempts to do. Okay. So now, unfortunately, and I know 
assume almost all of you have taken some complexity theory. And unfortunately, this, this is an NP-hard problem. Okay? So if you've taken complexity theory, you know what this means, or algorithms. Uh, and I, I believe this is taught in the end of, of the algorithms class. If you haven't, it just means that we don't expect to be able to solve this efficiently. Provided and less, provided that p is different than p, which sort of most people believe, then we really don't expect to be able to solve this efficiently, right? But whenever you have a data set, uh, you know one of the first things people do when they have a data set on the computer is actually apply what they call the k-means algorithm. Okay? So the k-means algorithm, what people call the k-means algorithm, is something called actually Lloyd's algorithm. algorithm for k means right so so a very popular approach or, or i should say well, that is a very popular approach okay so what what what's the idea here okay so lloyd lloyd's algorithm relies on the following observation okay which i can call this uh, proposition say Okay, so in the lecture notes, this is called a proposition, which is that, uh, so this simply it relies on the fact that, it relies on two facts. So I'm gonna give this propositions in two ways. In two, there, there'll be two mathematical statements. Okay, given, right? So uh, given the centers, given a choice for centers, uh, mu one. Okay, so let me give you a few seconds to think about this. If I give you the centers mu one and mu n, what is the partition, the choice of partition that minimizes the that objective? Right. If I tell you what the centers are, if I give you the green points, what is the choice of uh, of partition that minimizes the sum of the red lines, the squares of the red lines? Well. You just have for each point to decide how to minimize its the length of its red line. So clearly, you just put it closest to the center. Right? I mean, I essentially just proved it. Uh, given a choice for the centers, the the, um, the partition that that minimizes the k-means objective. is simply to assign a point xk to the closest center, which is, of course, very efficient. So if you have a genie or a fairy that comes and gives you the center, then it's very easy to find the partition. OK, fine. There's another side to this, to this proposition, maybe not quite as obvious, which is given and choice for the partitions for the partition. And let's say S1 away union SK. Turns out that computing the optimal centers is also easy. And the optimal centers, the, the choice, the centers, mu1 mu k that minimize the k-means objective is given by, are given by so mu l is actually just the average of the points. So I in cell, so the, how many of them there are, and just the average of them. Okay. So, okay, proof of this will be, is, is left as a challenge. It's an easy challenge. I mean, the first one is, is almost by, you know, there's, there's almost nothing to prove. I basically just proved it. The second one needs a little bit more work, but re really not very much. So, so it's a challenge and, and an easy one. Okay, so so 
think about this for a second. So we have this objective that is hard. It looks like a you know pretty nasty optimization problem. We actually know it's NP hard. It's not obvious why it's NP hard. You just have to believe me, but we really don't expect to be able to solve it in polynomial time, at least not for all inputs. And now the observation that gives rise to Lloyd's algorithm. I, I don't know if the observation was first made by Lloyd, but but that gives rise to, to Lloyd's algorithm is that if, if only I had a ferry that gave me the centers, then getting the right partition would be quite easy. If I had a ferry that gave me the partition, getting the centers would be quite easy, right? And so then how, how, how do you transform this into a computer heuristic, into an algorithm? You just say, right, so what, 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 what does Lloyd's algorithm do? It just says, let's turn this into an algorithm, right? Start with a partition, right? For example, at random. And then iterate, right? Uh, compute the centers, update, compute, computer update. Best partition right and just just iterate right repeat until no update is done okay this is Lloyd's algorithm you may have seen already animations of it working, and we'll have one uh, for you at some point. But this is the algorithm. It's a super simple algorithm. And you may even know, you know, if you've ever worked with data and so on, you may even know that people sometimes do k-means plus plus and, and, and things like this. Essentially, what, what that is about is about picking this, is about improving this part of the this part of the procedure of starting, or maybe sometimes like trying once, and then uh, if it doesn't look right at the end, just start again and things like this. But they all sort of uh, go, they all start here. Okay, and Lloyd's algorithm does this. Okay, so now we're, we're, met, we're, we're uh, high to in, in the mathematics course. So what are the natural questions that we can ask ourselves? All right, there's many natural questions that should be in your mind. All right, one, okay, so questions. So it's clear that iterating this is very, very easy, right? Because if you believe after you've, you've proved the proposition above, right, then each one of these steps is something that the computer can do very easily, right? So this algorithm can run quite fast, at least the iteration of it. So there's many questions though, right? I think as a mathematician, it's natural to ask, will it actually stop? Will it actually always stop? So, so this is actually proving this is one of the challenges. And the way that you can prove this will actually give you, uh, you know, it's, it's an argument that, that here in this setting is quite simple, but it's actually the basis, the, the basis argument to prove that most algorithms stop, much more complicated ones where the argument will look much, much more complicated, but at the core is the same argument. So this is a very good thing to think about. So it, it will stop indeed. Think about why, how, or how can you prove that it will stop? Right? Will it? Will it always reach the the actual optimum, what we call the global optimum? Yeah, I sometimes use this language of global optimum and local optimum. I assume you've seen some of this in numerical analysis, but it means exactly what, what you'd expect it to mean. The global optimum is actually the minimizer of this, while the, uh, when I say a local optima, I mean something that if you just look around it, it looks like, I'm, like a minimizer or you know, the algorithm gets stuck in it, and, uh, but it's not actually, it does not correspond to the global minimizer. Of course, you know, if we really think in terms of, uh, of math, we, we wouldn't actually add the word global right? Uh, a minimum by definition is the global minima, but when we're talking about algorithms, it makes sense sometimes to, to sort of be, you know, over-specify and use the word global. 
Okay, so that it, will it always reach the, the optima? Here, of course, the answer is no, right? Because otherwise, no. Uh, pr probably not, because otherwise it would be a proof that the right p is equal to np, and we, we, we know that you know this we, we haven't proved that, so this can't possibly be proof, but this is not a precise mathematical statement, what I'm saying. And uh, there, right? Because it could be that we can't prove that it reaches the global optima, but it actually might always. But in fact, it doesn't, right? And so... Another challenge is, can you come up with an example on which this does not reach the global minimum? Right, so can you come up with an example of points, of both points and starting, uh, you know, starting partitions instead of random, maybe you can pick even where the algorithm doesn't actually get, reach the, the global optimum. Okay. And so these are sort of the, the challenges for, for today. And now I think today will it's really quite light, so we'll end even a bit early, but let me just say a few more words. So, so besides uh, an, another challenge I put in the lecture notes is you, you after you build a counterexample for the fact that it reaches the minimum to, to show that it does not reach the minimum, I want you to think about how would you adapt the algorithm to, to avoid such issues. And as you as you investigate how you would adapt the algorithm, you will basically derive uh, the so-called k-means plus plus and all these packages or, or things similar to all these packages of k-means that are sort of improvements over Lloyd's algorithm. Okay, so that is a bit, bit more of an exploratory challenge. Okay, so k-means has, has issues, right? K-means is not perfect. Okay. And so what are, what are some of the issues of k-means? And I'm, I'm going through the issues of, of k-means because it, they, they highlight, uh, each one highlights something interesting that fixing it is actually, is actually an, interesting, an interesting thing to do. So one, of course, is that uh, k needs to be like k, one needs to know k. So from from at least the theoretical side, these things these are rarely issues. That it's really rarely an issue that that the, the fact that you don't know k, at least when you're doing things from the theoretical side. Because you know, if we're thinking about efficiency in terms of being, say, linear time, polynomial time, and so on, you can just try a few different k's. Right? It, it's still efficient. And so just try a few different k's and look what which one it looks right. So this is not usually on the theoretical side, it's not that big of an issue. Doesn't mean in practice it might not be. Okay. Uh, another issue is that it, it appears to need, right? So or needs or, or uh, I, I, should, I should be a bit more honest and say appears to need points to be in RD, right? To be in some Euclidean space. Because otherwise, how can we talk about centers? Or you know, at least you need some kind of geometry points to be in some you know at least have a metric to talk about uh, about centers and so on, right? And sometimes you might have points that you don't uh, you don't have them in Euclidean space. It doesn't make sense to talk about centers. Maybe all you have is you have points and you have like a protein protein interaction in which what you have is how much two proteins interact or how alike or alike they might look or something like this. And so this, this will be fixed. So basically, you will fix this on the homework. So in the homework, you will show that the, the, the k-means objective can be, can be written just in terms of distances between points. And you don't need to optimize over, over a center in Euclidean space. Okay. Okay. So then there's the other side of algorithmic challenges. Right, so Lloyd's algorithm doesn't always converge, so you might not actually be able to reach the minimum. And this is a whole, right, this is more sort of on the algorithmic side, but it's a, a very, very interesting thing that, I mean, we could spend a whole lecture talking about what, what then can you say? Can you talk about if the data is not just, you know, any points, but they actually have some special structure, then maybe you can actually reach to the global minimum of this. Or if the data is some random distribution, and, it, and then with high probability, it might prove your algorithm works. Or maybe you can prove that an algorithm, maybe not Lloyd's algorithm, always gets at least, it might not go to the minimum, but you can get within at least, say, 10% of the, of the, of the minimum uh, error or something like this. 
right? So, so there's a whole, like, th this goes into a whole field, right? But it's not what we're going to be focusing on. Another issue, which is also uh, perhaps the most, the most interesting one uh, for our sake, is that it requires convex clusters. Right, as in convex sets. Okay, so, so let me try to give you an example. Let's say that I have these, these, I get these vectors. I get these vectors, no, I get these points, sorry. So each dot is a point. And I get this data set. I would say that this looks very much like, we look at this, this looks very much like look two clusters, right? Looks like two clusters. But certainly k-means will never separate this, right? Because it's easy to see that because of how, right? Once I have the centers, the way I'm doing partitions, the, the partitions are always convex, right? Or they're always the intersection of a convex set in RD with the points, right? So k-means is not able to, to do this, right? To, to say that this is one thing, right? right? That this is one thing and this is another, right? So k-means will never be able to tell this. Okay. And so how can one how can one fix this? Right? And this will give rise to interesting ideas, some of which we'll be able to explore in the course, some of which we won't. But still is, is something worth mentioning. So there's essentially two ways to, to fix this. Or, or well, maybe there's more, but there's two important two important ideas of how, how to fix this. Right, so one is by adding, you know, by adding features, right? And this is something that's used very much in, in machine learning, right? And, and if we have time, we'll talk a bit about it. Just if I think of, you know, is these points in the x, x, in the x and y axis, right? The x and y axis. Then if I go from the points x, y, right? I know, create, take these points from two dimension and put them in three dimensions. I mean. Of course, I'm cheating because I see the point, so I know what I should be doing, right? Maybe I go to, so I y square, right? Then all of a sudden in 3D, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, right? In 3D, these points are sort of in a parabola, right? Where the, the middle cluster is here, right? And the big cluster is up there. And now I'm able to separate them, right? Because now I can just, this can be my separator, right? This could be my center and this could be my center, right? So somehow by extending the dimension of things, I made them easily separable. This is, this is an extremely powerful idea, right? Of creating features and so on. This is also, this is also has to do with like the things like kernels, if you've heard about this. Another, another idea is to say, well, because, you know, because what you're going to do in the homework, you know that actually the k-means objective, or, or you, know, you could imagine that a clustering procedure of this type certainly works, I can make it to depend only on distances between points. Then I can define a new distance, right? I can now define a distance in which, say, I have these points and I say, well, if they're nearby, Let's say if they're closer than, than something, I do some say circle. And if they're nearby, I, I declare them very close. And if they're far away, I declare them very far away. Okay. Right, so the points will be very close to these and they'll be very far away from the other ones. And now I can either try to do k-means with this new notion of distance in which points that are closer still remain closer in this distance and points that are sort of at, you know, at a big distance, they consider just a distance plus infinity or something like this. Or I can even build a graph in which I just connect nearby points. And now from the viewpoint of a network, these are two clusters, right? Because you will never make a connection that goes from here all the way to there, right? There will never be a connection between the two. And so there are two ways of, of, of dealing with this issue that sometimes, you know, data is not, not clusterable with convex clusters or not even or not linearly separable. 
right? Which is that you can create new features or you can define new distances. And it turns out that this is sort of related and it all comes with, uh, right? It all is, is related to this idea of kernels. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about dimension reduction. And if I get to go into spectrograph theory, I'll tell you about how once after where you have a network, you can use then very linear algebra methods to actually cluster the network. Right. Well, here it feels very much like if I would, if I want to use linear algebra, I should not be able to split these things because this is very feels very nonlinear. Okay. So, I mean, I I think we're, we're we're done for today. So, I this was very very much a warm up as a motivation. I sort of tried to give an overview of the class and then just a very very simple warm up and and showing you a few issues to motivate some of what's to come. And so next, um, and there's a few challenges if you want to think about some some nice, uh, you know, relatively easy uh, math problems. Some of these challenges are nice. And then next lecture we'll start with dimension reduction. So next lecture, next lecture, we'll start with something much more mathematically rich. So we'll start with dimension reduction, and in particular truncated SVD and truncated SVD, and uh, Maybe already tomorrow we'll, we'll prove um, the theorem that states that uh, the, the truncated SVD is the best low rank approximation for a matrix on any Shadden P norm. Okay, so the, the, this is much richer mathematically what's, what's, what's to come. And then I'll talk a bit about PCA and so on, and then we'll move into parsimony maybe like three weeks from now. Okay, okay I'm done. I mean, today you get uh, 10 minutes of, uh, of extra free time. It was just meant as a, as a very, uh, you know, very light warm up. But I'm I'm going to stick around. If there's any questions, feel free to yeah ask. What you want? I'll.